Charles, take care of it. Marco. Hey, hi everybody. As you alluded, I am Charles Butler, aka Lazy Power on Twitter. And today we're going to be talking about Ansible and Juju sitting in the tree. And what's interesting about this particular concept is that this expands beyond just looking at Ansible as a configuration management toolkit. These principles will apply to any configuration manager. Because this can easily be substituted with, say, Puddle. And you want to model or, and you want to model your application in Juju because you've heard that Juju is great at modeling applications and defining the operational intelligence and how it talks to other uh, services. So I wanted to give a talk that's specifically targeted at combining all the things. And it doesn't necessarily matter what the underlying, um, the underlying heavy lifter in this technology is, whether it's Ansible or whether it's Python, Bash, uh, Chef, Puppet, you know, the, the who's who name of, of in this, this sphere. Uh, we know that Ansible does a great job of configuring the machines. We know that Juju does an excellent job of modeling these. So they can interop and they can work, and you don't necessarily have to know all the terms of that particular configuration management toolkit in order to consume it. So before we really look at how this integration works, we have to understand a few primitives. We have to understand what a charm is and what its intent is. So charms allow you to encapsulate operational knowledge such as how to deploy, manage, scale up, scale down, how it's going to communicate with other services, what that communication contract looks like, and how they all communicate with one another. So with that primitive in mind, let's take a look at the, at the small basic building blocks that built that up. So the components of a charm, there's one primary piece, which is our metadata.yaml. This is the only file that's required to build a charm. This allows you to define certain properties about it, such as the name of the application, uh, what it's going to be able to relate to, and what <coughs> interfaces that implements, uh, what, uh, what different tags make this up so it can be categorized in, in our software catalog, and uh, some descriptions so that way people know uh, what's, what's actually going on inside the charm or what's going to provide to you. The, the next step down, and, in order of importance, is the reactive modules. And reactive modules are executable code that allow you to react to states that arise when you're uh, working with your, your char. So there's three uh, powerful points here to, to think about. Uh, so these states and, and reactions, there, there are configuration events, there are application lifecycle events, and then there's also communication events when you start to relate these services to one another. So stepping down into the next step is configuration. Since Juju allows you to model uh, your applications, and that can be comprised of one to many units, the configuration for that is going to span every unit. So no matter if you're scaling up, you're scaling down, you're going to get a consistent configuration against this group that, that comprises that, uh, that single application. Uh, and relations and interfaces declare how an application is going to uh, communicate and interact with its peers. And that's what allows you to say that I am going to deploy this, this uh, media wiki instance, and it needs to relate to a database. And we know inherently that it's going to give us a connection string that's going to contain a username, a password, a host that we can connect to, and a database. So that's what the, the relations interfaces allow us to do, is we can define that, and we can dictate the, the communication contract. So I've talked a lot about Juju. And we've got a good idea of what's going to make up a charm, but the question is, how does Ansible fit in with this? <laughs> so, at its basic fit, reactive modules or hooks call Ansible to execute plays tagged with the states that are currently active uh, on this particular unit. And at which point, Ansible is going to load the configuration data that you have declared in your charm declaration. It's going to expose those, make them available to you, as well as any relationship data that comes in. And they're going to be exposed as template variables within your playbooks and templates. So this is a very natural feel if you're comfortable with writing Ansible plays. So I think the big takeaway from this is that when you're working with layers to build a charm, this new primitive emerges and this new thought pattern that you only have to focus on your deltas the change in states that are super important to your workload that, that you don't have to worry about how to deliver Ansible. Do I need to add a PPA? Do I need to find that GPG key that they're signing all their packages with? Uh, do I need to add users on the system to run Ansible? Uh, you know, maybe you're delivering a PHP workload and you're typically setting up Apache. If, you're, if you pull in a layer, 
specific to that component, and then your application is delivered into it, so you write a layer on top of it, you're only managing and reacting to the states that are important to you in your workload. And you can remain a domain expert in what you know and leverage the expertise of other users, which really enables you to move fast. So along the vein of managing your deltas, when we look at a layer, it's a fairly skinny directory structure, and it's comprised of just a few files. We have the most important piece here, which is a layer YAML. And this is where we define what we're going to pull in our extra resources, whether that's an Apache layer, uh, whether it's, in this case, the Ansible layer or Chef layer. It could easily be any of those. There are some other pieces in here, such as a config YAML, which define your application configuration. There's the metadata YAML, which defines your charm. There's the playbook YAML, which is your, your Ansible uh, heavy lifting. And then the reactive with Elasticsearch.py, this is your reactive module. So with this high-level map, let's go ahead and let's dive deep into this. Let's assemble a charm that's powered by Ansible. And let's dig in. Okay. So I'm going to... Do I need to bump up my font? We good? Bump it. That's good. We're good now? All right. Um, so what I've done is I've treated a directory of my layer. And I have all the stuff sitting on my, my computer. And we see the same map. We have a config YAML, our layer YAML, metadata playbook, and our reactive directory. There's some extra stuff in here because I, I was trying to be a hero and, and get some more stuff in here to, uh, to explain. But in the interest of looking at things, the, the layer YAML, which defines our, our exit layers that we're going to pull in, we see that we have an includes directive, and then it drops right into an array, and we have a string here that represents layer colon Ansible base. So what this is going to do is this eliminates any boilerplate that I would have had to write in the past to build a GG charm. And I get all of that for free. Then on top of that, additionally, I get an Ansible delivery pattern. So it's going to install Ansible, it's going to add the PPA, add the GPG key, do all the things that it needs to do, and it's going to set a reactive state. It's going to set a synthetic event that you can now subscribe to in your charm and say, hey, whenever Ansible's done, I would like to do something and participate. And since we've looked at the layer, before we dive into the actual code of the layer itself, I want to dive into the metadata just real quick to show how quickly, quick and easy to start to write. So with this meta, we give it a name. So this is what's going to be what we, what we generate. It's going to generate an Elasticsearch charm. Our description tells people exactly what this is. It deploys Elasticsearch via layers with Ansible. And then it's not a subordinate. Uh, and it defines some of the communication contracts here. So this key here for peers is the type of relationship group. It implements one peering relationship by the name of peer. And it, it is implemented with an interface of HTTP. The same can be said for the provides. This is declaring to Juju that it provides a client relationship using the Elasticsearch interface. All this stuff has been fairly straightforward. Is anybody lost where we're at right now, or are we still feeling pretty good? Excellent. So since we've looked at this, and we know that we're working with this, this skinny piece of code, let's take a look at our actual reactive module. So this particular reactive module is written in Python. The reactive framework works as well in Bash. Um, and we get, we get a lot of the same syntactic sugar in this. So at the very top, we import this Python module from the charms reactive. We want to import our decorators, when and when not. And that's what gives us these nice decorators here with this at when ansible.available. Now this is an implicit state that's raised by that ansible base layer. So it's declaring to uh, this particular application that I now have installed ansible and once this is there, I would like to execute do something. I would like to execute this method. And if you notice on the next line down, we have from Charms import Ansible. This is new. This allows me to interact with Ansible from within a Juju Charm, and it gives me a nice syntactic language to do so. So since we have this uh, do something, we are just going to invoke that. We're going to say Ansible. We want to apply our playbook. And we're going to target that particular playbook. It's playbook.yaml. And that's bundled right in our layer. You betcha. So this Python module, I guess it can be called before Ansible is available? That is correct. 
So whenever it's whenever you're whenever reactive invokes, it's going to start a messaging bus, and it's going to start running through every time a state change happens. It's going to reinvoke this bus. So if this ansible.available state is not declared, it doesn't matter how many times you hit this in the code, it's not going to execute. That's a that's a gate. Yeah. So we also have a qualifier to not execute this again when Elasticsearch is available. We don't want to re-execute this block. Now you might notice that we don't actually set anything for Elasticsearch.available, and that's intentional. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so how many here have actually written Ansible playbooks and plays? A fair number, good. So this should be pretty familiar to you. We define our host, we want to run this line at the top, and we declare some handlers. And what handlers are in Ansible is they allow you to set, uh, this is now a block of code that's going to execute when I tell you to do something. This can be restarting an application, uh, potentially notifying something that you're now available, uh, whatever the case may be that you would want to invoke on a, uh, basically a fairly consistent basis. <laughs> The next line down is we define some variables. This is used whenever we template. We declare a service name variable. And you'll see here that in line, we have some, uh, some Jinja templating. This is uh, liquid templating to me from my old hat. And we see that it's just a, a double curly bracket, local unit that split. And what we're wanting to do is this is being passed in implicitly by that charms.ansible. This gets generated for you and is exposed. And directly below that, we have tasks. And we notice that we have an include here. We're including another task file. So just like every other Ansible playbook that you write, you have the same amenities available to you. Sure, Corey. Um, are the list of things that are going to be implicitly passed in uh, documented in the Ansible layer? They are not, but I'll tell you why. This is a zero, a Z.1 release. So I still have a lot more work to do to, to catch up everything. But whatever is available in the, the Juju environment is passed in implicitly and available to you as template data as well as unit data, configuration data, and relationship data. So I want to take a brief break from this particular playbook and let's bring up that task. So when we look in this install Ansible task, this looks just like the last playbook. We declare a name. We have some tags here, which is what helps control execution. But these tags can be either the hook name or the reactive synthetic state. So we can also guard against when we run things in our Ansible playbooks based on the environment and reactive states that we have available to us. This bit down here for app keys and Ansible built-in, that's the URL, and now we see that we have this variable here for app key URL, and we don't necessarily know where that came from. We have a pair of curly brackets and this thing here. So this leads me to one more file we're going to take a brief uh, intro into. And when we look at our configuration YAML, to bring this all the way back to the beginning, the config YAML is what allows us to define configuration shared amongst many units, one to many, in our charm. So no matter how many units we have, they're all going to inherit this. And we see this config key here for app repository. It's a string variable, and we had to give it a default, so if the user that's deployed this doesn't supply value, it's still pretty safe. They're going to get uh, Elasticsearch from their, their PPA. And we give it a description so that way whenever you look at this, you can juju get this particular service or look at it in the GUI. Look at it in the GUI. This will be uh, front and center so that way they know exactly what they're looking at. So that, that same principle applies to the remainder of the configuration options. <coughs> and back in here, we see here that that app key URL. If you were astute, you noticed it had hyphens. This is a Python convention that you must transpose those to underscores. And this is uh, transposed for you by the, by the charm.ansible uh, module. We want to have this uh, repository present. And we get the GPG uh, ID. And we also guard that whenever the app key URL is not empty string. The next play, we have the archive, pretty standard stuff. And then we want to install any dependent packages. Same thing here, we use a little template even with item and then with items decorator and we just declare our packages in line. So this is all pretty standard Ansible stuff. This is all things that I'm familiar with. So given the, the consideration that maybe you have some existing infrastructure that's already based on Ansible, and Juju looks super cool, with a few modifications to your playbook, you can bring that operational knowledge right with you into the Charmer ecosystem. And you can start using this to stand up and start modeling your applications.
So now that we've finished looking at that particular install, we notice that it's decorated with a tag for ansible.available, so we've got a guard. The next bit is that we drop in some templating logic. We want to update configuration for Elasticsearch after it's installed. We declare our, our template. Charm there is an implicit built-in for Juju as well. This is available in the environment. Give it a destination, our mode, backup. And then we want to notify our handler that it's time to restart Elasticsearch. So this is a very basic and simple example of how we can stand up Elasticsearch using Ansible in a Charm layer, leveraging components that I didn't have to write and maintain. In this particular instance, I did because I'm the author of the Ansible layer, but kind of a given. So oh, just one question. Where there is this um, host's local host, where is it executed? Is it executed on the machine which is desired to become the Elasticsearch, or is it run anywhere like where your playbooks are running? That's a brilliant question. So for anybody that didn't hear that, where is this going to be executed? So since we have this playbook and it's declared host as local host, is this going to be executed on my client machine, or is this going to be executed on the target machine? So what we're doing is we're delivering Ansible on that remote unit. This could be bare metal, a virtual machine, a LexD container. And we're going to install Ansible on that host and then execute that play as if we had pushed that YAML to it and told it to execute. So you're not going to be doing the, the remote agentless uh, portions of configuration management that Ansible exposes to you. This is just leveraging Ansible on that host. Mm -hmm. Okay. So local host was correct there. <laughs> correct. <Yeah. coughs> I can see some instances where that would be super handy and perhaps for, for another iteration. So if you'd like to collaborate on that, more than happy to. Okay. Um, if anybody's interested, I think just for completeness sake, I do want to show the template uh, that those same variables that were available to me in the, uh, in the playbook are also available to me in my Juju templating. Because all this is in passed and implicitly, so our cluster name came from config. These are static config values. And then if we get peers, we're going to list those peers in line in this configuration template. So now, we've looked at everything that we needed to do to build. So in recap, for about 30 lines of Python, give or take, we can take our existing playbook with a few tweaks. I'm gonna guesstimate in that particular instance it was maybe another five to 10 lines, setting guards for states and tags. We're now ready to assemble our charm. So if I type in charm build, it's going to generate a charm for me. So we see here that it's pulling in the layer basic, which is my boilerplate. This is code that I get for free that I would have had to write otherwise or generate some other way and then manage this in my VCS. You don't have to do this anymore. Now we pull in the Ansible base. We're getting Ansible delivered for us. And then it places my layer nice and neatly on top. All of my concerns are encapsulated and it's now the topmost layer in that charm. And it was output in my charm directory. So I can do something like juju deploy. And I'm gonna deploy this as ES2. So now juju's taking that compiled charm, sending it into my controller. And this model is now going to be deployed. And we're going to see Elasticsearch start to pop up in our GUI, and we can start to inter uh, interface with it. But in the interest of saving time, I already have one installed, and I trapped it on the install hook. Oh, I did. <laughs> get rid of that sleep. Let's get back in that Juju debug hook session. You might be wrong. No, Winning, nice. right? <laughs> Networking is a thing. Okay, so <laughs> what you're looking at now may not be terribly obvious to you, but this is what's called a debug hook session. This is a, a debugging tool that Juju ships with and allows you to connect to a, a host over SSH and it brings up a team up session. So it starts out with a normal bash, but you see here with the next tab that we're trapped in this install with a star. This is telling me that I'm currently in the context of the installation phase of my charm. So I can invoke this hook manually, which is basically what the blob of text is talking about at the top. So if I invoke that hook, a few things are gonna start happening. We start to see that the, the, reactive base, uh, reactive, uh, the reactive modules are being pulled in. It's installing and packing. We're gonna see it go through and install Ansible, which came from the Ansible layer, and that's gonna kick right into our, our playbook execution. Sure. Folder in your charm. 
Excellent question. So the question was, where did the hooks come from? Because we didn't see it in our topmost layer. So in layer basic, this is encapsulating all of the boilerplate that we would have had to execute before. So hooks are kind of a, a nomenclature, a nuance of how Juju works. Because Juju is an event-driven system. And you're guaranteed to have a few uh, that are always going to run, such as install, config changed, a start, and a stop hook. There are some other events that can arise, such as whenever you join in a relationship or whenever you upgrade a charm. But all of these come pre-baked for you in this base layer, and they, they work with reactive states. So you're no longer focused on the hooks. You're now focused on the synthetic states that are being set and removed on that unit. All right, we're just about done with the, the base layer. Any other questions while we wait for this to run? Could you please switch over to the reactive file itself for a second? Sure. So, uh, at the when and the when not, the ansible of the middle and active circle of the middle states are set by the layers of the right? Uh, the when ansible.available is. The when not elasticsearch.available is something that I would be concerned with in my topmost layer. To control my to control my execution flow. Right now, we don't have anything setting that. So if we were to re-invoke this every time that it hits the because remember that Ansible not available is just a qualifier saying that I can go ahead and proceed. We have no matcher for when not. So every time it hits, it's going to execute that block. And in item potency, we may not necessarily want that. I understood that, but my question was, how do I know the, the state? So is the available baked into it, or is it just some arbitrary state that I do not feel? They're synthetic, so they're arbitrary. The charm author will set those, and they're typically documented in the layer readme. Yeah. The Ansible layer will document that it will set the Ansible.available. Uh, the Elasticsearch uh, state would be just in this layer. So, so it, it went through, it installed Ansible uh, via the, the archive, so all that stuff happened. And we see now that it's starting to run that. This is the, the output from Ansible actually running through my playbook and executing those plays that are important to me. So it's starting to deliver Elasticsearch. This might take a minute, the repository is a little cookie. Excellent question so far. Any more? How did you trap that hook? Uh, I actually trapped that hook by whenever I deployed my charm before I started my talk. I gave it a sleep 60 so that would allow the VM to bring up, get an IP address in Amazon, and then in which the, with an and and juju debug hooks, this particular service Elasticsearch slash unit number, which would be zero. And so whenever it came up and it got its IP address, before we had even delivered the agent, it dropped me in there and dropped me in that TMUX session. Got it, cool. <clears throat> wow. Sad card mode. Wah, wah. All right, what do we have here? C local. <laughs> ah, didn't find the Elasticsearch service. Okay. Um, okay, so, so while I'm in this and I'm debugging, let's go ahead and take a look at debugging this environment. So you would ask how I can find out what states are available on this unit. So the reactive framework does add some nice CLI helpers, in which case I can get the states that are available to me. In this case, it's, it, it didn't complete, so none of my states are actually available on this machine. So if I say charms.reactive, set state ansible.available and if I can type dot set state I'm going to rerun that hook Playbook. Okay, so when we're working with uh, with the reactive framework and we're starting to call these, some of the nuances of what we're working with are now unfavorable demo gods. 
weird. Let's see here. Okay, so install so tags when Ansible is available. All right, so now oh, I know exactly what happened. Uh, so this is Elasticsearch. Uh, get states. Okay. So since this is so new, what, what, what actually happened is that uh, we're, we're passing these reactive synthetic states in. I showed the, the console helper where we went to charm our reactive get states and it gave us a printout of what would have been set on that host. So what I forgot to do is pass this actually into Ansible and charms about Ansible at the most recent edition that I cut this morning actually has that code baked into it by default. That if you don't pass it tags, it gathers all that from the environment and it pushes that into Ansible. So they're able to communicate with one another. And what we're gonna see now is that with some fingers crossed. <laughs> Can't win. Um, okay, so what would have happened is it would have been self Ansible and we could curl localhost 9200 and, and life would have been great. Um, instead of debugging this live on stage, that, that was the intention. But the takeaway from this is that with about 15 lines of Python, we were able to integrate with a tool that we already know. We were able to leverage that experience and operational models that we already have encapsulated in configuration management and bring that right along with us when we start modeling these services. So you can start consuming app, uh, charms out of, the, out of our for charm store and start working with them, whether that be uh, taking, the, taking the communication contract via an interface, saying that I'm going to get a host name, a username, a password, and a database name, whatever I relate to my SQL, and start using those primitives. And you don't have to manage, you don't have to necessarily be experts in how to deploy my SQL in order to consume, relate, and interact with it. They don't need crash because I can't. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like bad juju for the minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really got me now, not even my clicker works. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, do we have any questions so far about what we learned? Um, no? Sure. So this, this works great for Ansible, but could. What about, what if I have all my expertise in another puppet or tool? Sure, so uh, what we show here is that we have some abstractions with charm.ansible. Now, while you may not necessarily have a Python module available to you today, the same exact principles can work. You can use Juju as your modeling language and use it to drive your configuration management tool. So in the instance of Chef, which is something that I'm very familiar with, what you can do is use Chef Solo and pack your cookbooks. Well, I yes, want to know, question, I'm, I'm sorry. Here. I'm, I'm just one man in the corner. Yeah. That's fair, that's fair. So you can, you can use Chef, Chef Solo, and pack your cookbooks in. Just include that in your layer. Uh, I would highly recommend you abstract installing Chef Solo into another layer to provide that baseline so anybody can consume that. You layer your application on top that you care about, pack your cookbooks in, and then just set those environment variables as uh, aliases in your, uh, in your cookbooks. And then that becomes available to you natively in your Chef. And you can continue using the DSL that you're familiar with and you have all of your operational knowledge encapsulated in and leverage that now in modeling. So it's, it's, it's fairly intuitive. Uh, and in order to get started with it for stuff that doesn't exist today, it takes a little bit of legwork. Uh, yesterday I spiked on the sample integration and in a matter of six hours, I was able to go from just thinking about this and how it should look to an actual somewhat functional demo today. So, did, did that answer the question for you? Oh yeah. Just, so. just a quick question. That, that <coughs> six hours was that to get Ansible, a, an ans a reusable Ansible layer that other people can use, or was that just specific to that particular example? Oh no, sir. I, so I, I'm actually. Let's go to the next slide so we can talk about talk, talk to that. So the six hours total was to le was to understand the leverage work that already existed. In order for me to deliver an Ansible layer, it took me about 45 minutes from time of inception to actual delivery and then moving up that chain. And what I wanted to do, what I spent a majority of the time on was working on the charms.ansible integration to give you that syntax sugar of ansible.apply playbook. Because I didn't want to put in a sub process .check call, you know, litter throughout my charm, because I don't really like to shell out to bash that much if I don't have to. <laughs> and everything that I did, free and open source available on GitHub, since this is all new, I, I put these links in here and I'll make sure that I post these slides uh, directly after the talk on Twitter as well. So I invite anybody that's interested in this subject, regardless of what configuration management toolkit you would like to express, 
your models in, let me know. I'll be more than happy to hop on a hangout and get you started and, and talk through the, the nuances of this. Did that answer, answer the question? What, what layers would be useful for folks in terms of enabling reactive style reuse of existing recipes or like pay, playbook equivalents? Show of hands. Let's. Yeah. 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 Chef? No, no, so also Ansible. Ansible. How many folks. How many folks would, would see themselves using Ansible? How many folks would see themselves using Ansible? Chef? <coughs> Interesting. Just, Puppet? Just how many contractors? Yeah. So I go into companies and organizations and I pick up whatever crap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a lot of crap. At that level, it's great. I get paid well, but it's, I get paid well to deal with crap. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I finished my last contract on Friday for the NHS. There we had both puppet, chef, and they ended up writing it out in the shell in the end because there was no one with config management skills left in the team when I left. I saw Juju yesterday at your keynote and went, this is what I want, because I can take whatever I've got, whether it's a shell script, profit, chef, ansible, salt, and I've played with all of them, but I'm mainly a profit guy, and go, I'll wrap this in juju, and I don't care what you've given me, whether it's a shell script I've inherited, or some wonderful <laughs> tools and libraries. I'll wrap it in juju, and that's it, I can run with it. And that's what I'm interested in from you, and you, and yeah. I'm going to steal one of your phrases because uh, to, to put it bluntly, you get it, and that is amazing. So when I, when I work in layers, like so, so how many of you here have cruised around the internet and you see the, the curl this script and pipe it to sudo bash and this is our installation <laughs> method. How many of us actually like doing that? <laughs> right? <laughs> I like that. And I mean, if you like that, awesome. You can still embed that in your chart. But what I prefer to do is to take that script and deliver it as a payload. There's no more need for you to w get that. You're going to get the, the, the warm fuzzies of knowing that this is now packed in this layer. Thousands of people are using it and it's not modified. This is something now that, that we can kind of, kind of gate and control. If you look at the layer docker, that's exactly what that is. I took the bash script that's available on their wget URL, added some nice juju salt to it, and this is how we deliver docker. I just want to add that we can really use your help for all of these because we can make generic layers, but at the end of the day, you know, we can't be experts in every single config management tool. That's part of the reason we're here is to like, if we can get the experts of, you know, Puppet and Chef, you know, making those layers and making those, you know, you guys can make those layers way better than we could by ourselves because fundamentally you, you work with the tools every single day. So we would, we would any, any help in that regard, we'd love it. Good point, good call to action. Uh, our Juju mailing list is a great place to start that conversation. Come join us on IRC. We're in pound Juju on irc.freenode.net. Just about all day, every day. If you see lazy power in there at 3 a.m., tell me to go to bed. <laughs> so one of the things I see quite a lot, and it blows my mind, is uh, especially in larger organizations, is they'll have a really competent database team that uses, say, Chef, and then they'll have a really competent like apps team that uses Puppet, and then they scratch their heads when they're trying to figure out how to deploy both of those things in one place, right? So dueling config management systems. And we've seen some success with those teams being able to wrap their stuff and kind of have the different teams benefit from other teams' work effectively. As the, as the um, kind of core body of open source charms has grown, right, things like OpenStack and some of the big data and container management stuff, um, uh, people become more comfortable consuming that <coughs> stuff from outside the organization. But just being able to wrap stuff in different config management systems inside the organization and glue it together is interesting too. Sure. You mentioned how uh, Juju can make it more rich. Specifically, you talked about Elasticsearch here, mm -hmm. but um, making making Elasticsearch even more richer as far as adding some Juju Juju bits to it. Right here. Can right. you expand on that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So the beautiful part about this is that Ansible, whenever you're working with with uh, trying to get data from another system. Typically that happens via, it's, it's going to crawl it over the network, hit that machine, and pull whatever it needs to get out of it. So that's not necessarily intuitive to me whenever I'm modeling. 
So I want my tool to, to express this relationship. And this is where packing your Ansible playbooks and, and Juju Charms really starts to shine because you get to leverage the relationships and interfaces. So you get consistent results for getting this data. And it's very naturally expressive through this relation get. What am I getting back over the wire? I now have a, a JSON object saying that I got a username, a host, a password, and a database. What I do with that is up to me as the charm author. I can put that in a template. I can utilize that in the uh, command line argument, whatever the case may be. And I didn't have to worry about whether or not this unit can communicate to this uh, application can communicate with this application because maybe they're in completely separate uh, network partitions. So uh, by leveraging the amenities that Juju is exposing to you, you can knock those barriers down and really accelerate your, your charming experience and how to model that application and what it should be doing. Any more? Any more questions? Yeah, three minutes. Three minutes? Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a very special question. Sure. Um, um, I'm using, most of the time I'm using Ansible not to deploy machines, but to deploy, for example, stuff in AWS like an SQS queue or whatever, a Lambda function or an ELB. And would this fit into here or would you say then rather write and better write something like in, in Juju, or could I also reuse the Ansible stuff? Because this won't do anything on the machine itself, it will just provision something in, at my cloud provider. I love that you just asked that, because <laughs> what you've just described to me is what we refer to in our world as a proxy charm. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to modify the host. Mm -hmm. You could be relaying that request to Amazon Route 53 to update a DNS entry. So you can leverage that Ansible playbook mm -hmm. And so long as you're getting the data that you need to fulfill that request, and just proxy that back. If you're getting anything back that you need to relay back to your, your principal service, you can do that right with the relationship amenities that are available to you. Okay. It's quite a funky idea. So if, if I can, I just want to sort of double down on that idea, right? We have this notion that if you see the model and you've got this service talking to this service, that both of those things are running in the same place. And it's true that charms for both of those things are executing in the same place. But this set of charms could be sitting in a lightweight container. It essentially costs nothing. It's just a little place to execute charms. And that can be talking to a mainframe or driving Route 53 or something like that. Right? What you're giving people is a representation of something. And so the term proxy charm essentially came about because often there's infrastructure that's been deployed other ways and can't be changed. We want to glue stuff to that infrastructure. And so this becomes a very nice way if you create that proxy here that essentially everything else can be related to the proxy. The proxy knows how to poke that thing with a stick to get to get the you know stuff done, and it allows this stuff to be integrated very very quickly. So that's a pat common pattern for talking to either legacy infrastructure stuff that was deployed um, in a non-modeled way, or stuff that's remote effectively, like, like AWS, you know, some non-VM service effectively. We have enough time for one more. So, what if we take this concept to the extreme? What if we make, for example, a thousand <coughs> or a hundred thousand of proxy charms? Is there a way to do this still efficiently? I think so there is. And the way that I think that you would model that is with lightweight containers, because Lexi containers are perfect for running idle workloads because they don't consume resources. So every proxy charm that you deploy, by the nature of Juju, you're going to get an agent that's going to execute these, uh, these, these hooks, these states for you. So for each one of those that you deploy, you can put in a container. And you can even provision a host to warehouse that or you can co-locate it with other services you've already got deployed in your, in your then, infrastructure. Then you still have like 700 megabytes of overhead for each proxy charm, which is about the size of an Ubuntu image in the Lexi container. That's fair. So, so, so it's a super interesting question, right? Is there an even lighter weight way to co-locate things? One would be to have a convention which would, a convention in the writing of those charms, which would guarantee that two of the same charms wouldn't kick each other, right? You could put them both in the same container then, and they won't, because they're really talking about yeah. other infrastructure, yeah. they shouldn't, yeah. right? But that would all be by convention, right? Yeah. But the other downside to that is that Juju serializes hook invocation per container. Because if you've got two charms in the same container, you can do that, right? You can, you can put, multiple charms in the same machine image or in the same container. Uh, what, 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 we, what, what we worry about is a case where 
simultaneously two hooks get invoked and now they deadlock effectively on some resource inside that container. So to, to manage that, Juju serializes hook invocations inside one container. If you have a cluster of many machines and many containers, many hooks can be going at the same time, but each of them is exclusively happening inside a container. So the downside of that approach would be all of your proxies, if they were all co-located, we call them hook smashed effectively, in the same container, that you'd be serializing hook invocations to that, which may not be a problem, but, but, but you should be aware of it. Maybe it's, it, I, I think it would be cool as, as maybe a future work for Juju, if multiple charms that are co-located could somehow tell Juju that they are they don't have dependencies on each other, that they can be um, they don't have to sequentially be executed. Right. So 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 you could essentially say it's okay to yeah. invoke. That's a that's a nice idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It would have to be declared by both charm authors, right? That both have to say. I'm good with him, he's good with me, we're good, right? And then yeah. you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's Maybe reverse dependency, or yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no dependency. Yeah. You don't think just practically, if you've got thousands of <coughs> services, you'd want to organize these by logical models, right? The nice thing about <coughs> models is you're trying to take your workloads and think about them, like, you know, break it apart, not have one giant massive infrastructure, but little pockets that are understandable in each one. So while you'd have thousands, you wouldn't actually Run all thousands at once in one thing, you know, in one thing. So there's just a matter of scales, break it apart a little bit. Okay. You, you've got some room to grow things before you hit the end of the road problem there. For yeah, I, I for for the things that, that I'd, I'd like to do, I would, I would get to that yeah. size very, very fast and try. Right. I think that's all the time for me. Thank you everybody for the time.